Okay, so uh, today I wanted to introduce a new book called Appearing and Empty. Okay, it sounds like a contrib contrib contradiction. They, things appear, but they're empty. And it's not contradictory. It's talking about the two truths and how things appear to us, but they can appear falsely uh, as having a mode of existence that they don't have, inherent existence, and they are actually empty of that. But I'm not here to do a whole talk about that right now, because this is just a BBC. So, <laughs> um, this is appearing, uh, but an empty is the ninth volume in the Library of Wisdom and Compassion uh, that uh, is His Holiness's work. And the cover is Sarasvati. Yeah, so she's playing a lute, and musical instruments usually symbolize impermanence because sound is so clearly impermanent. But she's uh, also the goddess of wisdom. And this picture is from uh, His Holiness's office. I asked them to kindly offer one, and they sent this, which I thought was so beautiful. Yeah. So the book... Yeah, the first section of the book uh, talks about the two truths. So uh, conventional truths, often called veiled truths, because their ultimate mode of existence is veiled. We cannot see it with our senses, um, our core senses. And uh, so the, the first chapters are about yeah, veiled truth or conventional truth and ultimate truth, the uh, way things actually exist, which is the, their selfless or emptiness. So it's a really, uh, learning about this, it seems complex to get all the terms right, but it's actually kind of fun once you, once you uh, understand it. So the first two chapters are about that. The third chapter is about ultimate truth, and it goes into... Uh, the different kinds of emptiness. Yeah. So even though the the emptiness of each object is separate to the cognizer who uh, directly cognizes it, the emptiness of one thing is the emptiness of everything. It appears in the same way. Chapter four is what exists and the reliable cognizers that know it. So how. Uh, you know, this is a big issue, Geshe was talking about it this morning, of how do you ascertain what exists, you know? And so ascertaining what exists on the conventional level, that mind is different than the one that ascertains what exists ultimately when you analyze what it is really. So that's... Uh, an interesting chapter too. It goes through the three criteria for conventional existence, you know, which gives us some clues about, you know, is the Wizard of Oz real? Yeah, we see him. Is he real? Yeah. Are we real? We see it. We see each other. Good question, huh? Verse, uh, chapter 5 is the world uh, of dependent imputed appearances. Okay, and the reason this is together with the two truths is because uh, the convention, whatever exists, exists dependently and by imputation. In other words, by being designated in dependence on a basis of which it's designated, okay? So we're designated on the basis of having a body and then different mental, you know, aspects. Yeah. And so it really goes into that, because we say, well, things exist by being merely imputed. So then the, the question comes, well, if does whatever you impute exist? Okay, so if I call this a giraffe, it, does that make it a giraffe? Okay, this is actually quite important. 
if you look at the politics that are going on right now and the court cases, yeah, what do you call certain behavior? Yeah, is that legal? Is it illegal? Yeah, is that presidential? Is it corrupt? You know, so how things are designated is quite important, but we have to make sure that, you know, the designations fit the object that's being designated, but there's nothing in that object that's designated in and of itself that makes it what it is. Okay? So things exist as what they are uh, by convention because we all kind of agree to call that thing by a certain name and use it for a certain um, function. Okay? So, you know, we have a package of tissues here. We, these are called tissues, right? Some people call them Kleenex. That's okay. We can, you know, exist, you know, accept that. If somebody calls them a rhinoceros, uh, that might be up for discussion. Okay? But before anybody named this tissue, you could have called it rhinoceros. But after we name it, and we agree to call it by a certain name, then that name is what we call it by, okay? But it can also have more than one name. There's also many languages, okay? But there's nothing in this that makes it a tissue. Is there? Are you sure? It seems like there is. Doesn't it look like it has a tissue nature? Like any jerk who walked in this room should know it's a tissue because there's something inherent in it. Yeah. Do our kitties know it is a tissue? Why not? It's inherently a tissue, we think. Okay, so we have to examine all of that. Okay, then we go into, if we're not already confused enough, uh, we go into talking about the discussions that happen between the Yogacharyans and the Svatantrika Madhyamakas. Okay, so there's one chapter about the mind and its objects in the Yogacharya system. Okay, that's also called the... Uh, Samsampa is Chitamatra, yeah, mind only system. <clears throat> and then the uh, seventh, that's the sixth chapter. The seventh chapter is talking about what selflessness is in, that, in the Yogacarya system. Um, that's very helpful when we talk to our Chinese friends because they often practice Yogacarya. But <clears throat> Chinese Yogacarya is not the same as how the Tibetan pandits describe what Yogacarya is. So don't grasp at inherently existent and accept one description of Yogacarya to mean that's what everybody says it is. Okay, so that's, that's chapters uh, six and seven. Chapter eight is talking about the two Madhyamaka schools. Okay, so what, what is it that they negate when they examine the nature of reality? And then chapter 9 is the Prasangika's response to the Svatantrikas. Okay, so there, there's big debates. Well, also with the Yogacharyas. And as Geshe-la pointed out this morning, the, the debates, really, they're not to make us confused. That's not the purpose of writing them although it seems like that when you're first learning them. But the purpose is um, to present one view of how people think things exist, and then to present another view, and then to, to check them out and see, you know, which one can, can uh, when we apply reasoning, which one makes sense, and which one makes sense to us, and when we meditate on it, you know, what happens? So it, it takes a lot of 
study to learn the vocabulary and the concepts, um, and a lot of meditation, too, to, to kind of really go into it. Um, but like they say, if realizing the ultimate nature were easy, we would have done it already and would have been out of samsara a long time ago. Uh, so it's going to take some time. Yeah, um, His Holiness says, uh, for example, that understanding bodhicitta is not too difficult. We can understand having a kind heart and love and compassion. That doesn't take, you know, a lot to understand. But generating bodhicitta is quite difficult. Whereas with emptiness, it takes a lot of energy to understand what is going on. But once you understand it, then the meditation, so they say, flows more easily and quickly. I've yet to experience that. <laughs> OK. Um, chapter 10 talks about the unique explanations of the Prasangikas. OK, so there's many of those, um, yeah, about subtle affi afflictions and how it views the past, present, and future. And we talked one time about the having ceased. Yeah, so that's real fun, too. OK, then chapter 11 is about incense, um, incense, insight. And here we're um, talking about it particularly uh, from the Pali perspective and the Chinese perspective, because we've already talked about it regarding the, the, um, the Prasangika perspective. Then, um, because His Holiness, when we you know, developed this the series of books, he said he, w he was very clear he doesn't want this just to be another Lam series of Lamrim books, but he wanted it to include material from the Pali tradition and from the Chinese tradition so that practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism could understand other Buddhist tr traditions better. Yeah. And he also wanted it to explain something about the other Tibetan traditions, not just the Galupa. Okay? So uh, chapter uh, 11, yeah, like, I'm sorry, chapter Chapter yes, chapter eleven is insight from the Tibetan, the Prasangika perspective. Um, chapter twelve is from the Chinese and Pali perspectives. Then thirteen, we get into the diversity of Chinese Buddhist schools. And since we have a lot of visitors from Taiwan and and Vietnam and so forth, it's helpful to know the different um, Buddhist schools that exist in those cultures and, and what they believe. And I just got an email today from uh, Venerable Jen, who, who you'll remember. And he said that um, this is the clearest explanation he's seen of the 10 Chinese schools. So <laughs> that's not because of me. It's because of the schools themselves. But it also clears up a lot of misunderstandings that happen between the Tibetans and the Chinese, especially regarding the Samye debate, yeah, where um, the Chinese abbot uh, discussed uh, what the Tibetans took as blank-minded meditations, and Kamala Shila refuted that. So that story has become quite ingrained in the Tibetan tradition. Whereas Geshe Tapke, if you'll remember uh, when he was teaching us, he said that he was beginning to question that story and found some other information. Uh, this, because it does create some difficulty if these kind of uh, stories or rumors about other traditions that have, you know, have been existing for centuries, because this debate uh, you know, was supposedly took place at the end of the 8th century. I mean, that's a long time to, to believe something, but is it correct? Yeah. And so to really clear up the misunderstandings. Yeah. The Chinese often think 
that the Tibetans practice magic and that, uh, you know, they don't keep Vinaya very well because of Tantra. That's a misunderstanding. And the, the Tibetans think the Chinese do blank-minded meditation, which they don't. And that's a misunderstanding. And then the Pali tradition thinks both the Tibetans and the Chinese, you know, are Mahayana, and that's completely apocryphal. So, you know, their scripture, the, the Mahayana scriptures aren't even valid, some people say. So I think what I see as part of our, our work here at Shavasti Abbey is because we have connections with the different traditions to try and dispel a lot of these understandings, uh, misunderstandings. And His Holiness's goal um, also is to bring about um, more understanding between the Buddhist traditions so that we can speak uh, together on issues of importance like war and peace and poverty and famine and so on. Okay, then chapter 14 is about Yogacarya and Tathagatagarbha in China. Okay, so which is different than how the Tibetans understand it. Again, quite interesting. Then uh, chapter 15 is Madhyamaka in China. So don't think that Madhyamaka exists only with the Tibetans. It also spread to uh, China and was translated, and it was a prominent school for a while. And now the Madhyamaka uh, view influences many of the different uh, Chinese traditions. Then uh, chapter 16 is more about Chinese Buddhism, and it's about the Buddhist renewal. And here, that, that happened in uh, China starting in the uh, last century, it got really big. And uh, one thing you may be surprised to hear is that one of the Chinese uh, abbots uh, started a school in China, um, not in mainland China, and he sent some students to Sri Lanka to, to learn Pali Buddhism, and he sent some students to Tibet to learn Tibetan Buddhism. So there were some Chinese monks at Drepum, at Geshe-la's uh, monastery, and one of them is Venerable Fat Sun, um, who began to translate uh, many of the books, many of the texts that were in Tibetan but had not been translated into Chinese. Yeah, so it's you know bringing about more discussion between the traditions on the philosophical level. Yeah, and then there's many things in the Chinese tradition that haven't been translated into the Tibetan. I don't know of so much work going on with that, but it would be very good if there were. So that's what appearing and empty uh, is all about. And um, this, um, Wisdom just published it two days ago. So, uh, Venerable, it's really interesting to hear that there was so much about Chinese Buddhism in this book. Mm -hmm. um, what sources did you use to pull that information together? Mm. What were you um, studying and who were you talking yeah, to? Okay. So when His Holiness said he wanted Pali and Chinese Buddhism, then it set me off to learn more about those. Very fortunately, I have friends who practice both of those. So in terms of the Chinese tradition, um, my full ordination, my bhikshuni ordination, was I took it in, in uh, Taiwan. And I, and I had been friends with um, uh, the luminary nuns for a long time. Venerable Wu Yin was my Vinaya teacher. And so uh, I've, they helped me arrange uh, some interviews with some of the uh, pr prominent Chinese philosophers, yeah, which were, were, were very, very interesting, yeah. And uh, so I went to Taiwan and, and did those. And then also Venerable Jianhu, uh, he was the abbot of Chungtai in, in um, 
Sunnyvale. So he was the one who, who really explained a lot to me about Chan Buddhism. I also read about these things. Um, there was a very, uh, I can't remember the title of one book, but it was incredibly informative um, to hear about how Chan Buddhism uh, developed um, because some of the qualms that the Tibetans had about Chan also, different Chan practitioners had about other Chan practitioners. Yeah, so it was very interesting to learn about this. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't make anything up because I, you know, I remember when I was a freshman in college, uh, we had to read Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. All I understood was the word beginner. <laughs> I didn't understand what mind was. I didn't understand Zen. All these um, koans and so forth. It was like what? Um, so it was. It was actually very nice to learn. I think as I learned more about Tibetan Buddhism, I understood Pali, the Pali tradition, better. And when I came back to look at Chan, I understood what it was saying better. Not completely, but better than before.